Well, you're welcome. My name is Brian O'Kelly. I'm Professor of Finance in DCU and I'm the course director for, for, for this program. And it's a great pleasure to see, to see you all here, or in this case, not to see you. You're all very shy. You're keeping your videos off, which is fine. Um, so I, again, I, I, you won't see too much more of me now because I'll be moving into the, into the actual slides uh, to, to, to walk you through the key details. But um, first of all, I'm delighted to see you and um, I, hope, I hope you find this instructive. But again, if you have any further questions afterwards, well, you contact Kira directly or you contact me. And in fact, I should, have, I should have put my details on the bottom. But anyway, it's fairly, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's brian.okelly at dcu.ie are my contact details and you'll find them on the web as well. So without further ado, I should go over now at this stage to the presentation. And um, let me, so where are we? Sorry, um, apologies. Sorry, I should, should right, yep, this one. Okay, so <clears throat> let's let's walk let's walk through this in any event. Um, sorry. sorry, there we are. So again, the, you, you know the course, so that and that's why you're here. So let's 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 briefly outline what, what we plan on covering in the next the next little while. I can't see it being more than half an hour, but of course, if questions come, by all means, it we will we'll stay on as long as we like. Again, you can you can text your call, you can text your messages through to Kira, and uh, we will deal with them as they as they come. So the agenda for this afternoon then is first of all to give you a bit of background to see what where did this, what were the origins of this course, why did how did it come into being, and again um, how how has it fared since then. Then we'll talk about the detail of the course itself, <coughs> what what's the syllabus, what what are the individual modules, and again what order they're occurring in, and so on. Then we'll talk particularly about how it's being delivered because obviously that's a big key concern right now. Everybody in a, in a post-COVID world will obviously be concerned um, to know that it's being delivered safely. We'll discuss that. And again, in particular, we'll be asking, well, what, what requirements, what, what do you need to have behind you before you'd actually, before you'd benefit from coming on this course? And indeed, what do we require of you? Because we don't want you to take it on if you don't feel, uh, if, you don't, if, you, if, we don't, if we don't feel you're able for it. And then finally, what should you expect to get at the end of all this? What career lies before you if, if you um, can successful completion of the course? <coughs> sorry, apologies. So starting with the background first. Well, um, sorry, apologies. We, we, yeah. So we have actually, in fact, I seem to, I seem to have lost a slide there. In fact, I, I, um, one second, yeah. There's, we had another slide there which, which discussed the background. The, the course in actual fact is the longest running and most successful uh, master's in finance course in, in the country. We, it started in 1990. Again, it was started as a collaboration between, uh, but in fact, it was, uh, it was initiated by, but obviously they came to DCU, the, the, the various different parties at the time, same time the IFSC was coming into being, they felt there was a gap that, the, that really the, the particular skills that were necessary in order to, to um, if you like, support the generation of the IFSC, and it's hard to imagine 30 years ago it didn't exist, and that now you, you now you see that, that the numbers of thousands of people that are employed down there that they felt that the market wasn't being well served so therefore they came to dcu and again we responded in that at that point in time and therefore it has been running ever since so as i say for 30 years it's got the longest the longest running and it's got over 600 graduates so you'll find yourself in good company very often you'll find yourself the person who's interviewing you for the job already has this qualification so again it's the, that's the nature of the qualification so to, to speak then particularly about the course itself. So the outline of the course then is, again, it's got 12 modules, so 12 indiv individual courses. All of these are two hour duration. And again, as I say, as the title would suggest, it's covering the key aspects of investment, treasury and banking. So again, we see people finding themselves either com coming from these areas or particularly looking to get into these areas. So whether you're working in the area of, of investment and that treasury will include obviously bank treasury as well as corporate treasury and then more generally wider roles in banking particularly. So again, it's two years part-time. Everybody who's doing this course is working. <clears throat> so therefore you, you, you will not be at a disadvantage if you are working yourself. In fact, uh, we, we actually don't actually, we, we'd rather not have you on the course if you aren't working because we'll see later on what the requirements are, but we particularly want people who have experience of, of financial services in their own workplace because you again you bring insights you, you you have a context for the work we're doing and therefore it's very important that we actually that, that you can actually um, bring that experience with you and again discuss it and uh, we, we can say argue in, in, in the best possible sense about you know what, what the merits of of it of the actual particular topic are 
Um, but it, but we do say we do want you to be working. And again, everybody is part time. So again, it's an ask. I mean, you, you should be ready for two years of hard work. Obviously, it's in addition, it's on top of the day job. So it's not for the faint hearted. But frankly, the people who choose to do that, I, you just wa I watch them progress later on. I know that they're going to progress well because they've already made the commitment. They're willing to take two years out of their life, if you wish, to commit to, to doing this course. It's, it's demanding and we don't apologize for that. <clears throat> we won't, as I often talk about, we will not devalue the currency. We will not make the course easier or make it lighten the workload because again, we need to cover the material. You need to know that material in order to make the progression that we hope you will make afterwards. <clears throat> So again, you're familiar with it. Again, lots of you have come from undergraduate degrees in recent times, and you're already well familiar with this. It's the idea of two 12-week semesters per year. <clears throat> in that sense, it's quite short. Really, you start, you start as we see, at the end of September, you're finished again by the end of May, and then again, you repeat the same thing the following year, except, of course, you actually also have the opportunity to, um, should we say, to, you have to do a dissertation at the end of the second year. We'll talk about that in a second. So three modules per semester. So again, you'll be familiar with this. Again, if you're an undergraduate, you're obviously you've got your full time. So therefore you will be doing six modules per semester. So it's three modules per semester for the postgraduate programs like this, part-time postgraduate programs. And again, <clears throat> we, we talk about the exams. Typically, let's say in the, case of the, in the case of the first semester, starting the end of September, you finish before Christmas, you take the, take the period off for Christmas and then exams typically follow in the second and third week of, uh, of January. And likewise, the, we, we, we start again in February, at the end of January, early February. We continue to the end of April, two weeks off, and then two weeks of exams, typically in the middle, two weeks in the middle of May. So therefore, that, the, the process, it's the same um, for each of the two years. And again, we have the dissertation then at the end of the year. So in a sense, the dissertation is what we call a kind of capstone. It builds on all the aspects, everything that you've actually learned can be brought to bear on this dissertation topic. And again, it's one you'll choose for yourself. You'll obviously be, you'll be assigned a, a, an actual supervisor who will actually guide you. Obviously the supervisor isn't there to do your work, but the supervisor will guide you. And again, you'll tip, people typically choose a topic which is relevant to their own particular work, one that actually their employer would be happy for them to do as a consultant to the, to the organization. So in a sense, it's very practical. And it, again, it gives you an opportunity to, in, in a sense, apply all that you've learned over the course of two years. <clears throat> and in particular, as I say, Professor Liam Gallagher, it will actually take you through that process. And again, he's many years of experience of doing this. I mean, he himself is, very, is, is a very widely published, um, let, let's say, researcher himself. So therefore, he's well used to the process. And again, he's well used to nurturing, um, let's say, the process amongst young individuals who haven't had experience in it before. Some of your course will have maybe done a, a dissertation at an undergraduate level, or at least a, a, large, a large assignment at the end of your undergraduate studies. But this is a, this is a rather bigger item. So again, we have here the, the, just a the detail then of what's involved in each course. So say, as we mentioned, they start late September. It might be, it might be a, maybe a week later this year because of all that's going on, but we will be starting by the beginning of October, certainly, but more likely late September. So we have three, we have three modules here. The first one is financial statements analysis. Again, remember what, what we're attempting to achieve here all the time is to try and equip you to work in the areas of investment, treasury, and banking. So if you were to work in any of those areas, you absolutely have to understand how to analyze financial statements, interpret them, make, make sense of them. And then obviously on that basis, this, for example, this will be extremely important for an understanding of, should we say, equities. So how do you actually value an equity? You need to be able to understand the accounting, the, the, the financial statements that a firm produces. Likewise, you want to understand banking. We'll go, if you're going to extend credit, if, we're, if we, when we undertake credit analysis, you need to be able to understand the actual credit, the financial statements that the firms who are looking regulation. So, as I say, there's no need to say what that feeds into in this, in this situation here again. By the way, I should say, in the case of financial state analysis, we have um, Colin McCormick, again, from Bank of Ireland. So he himself is already working in the industry, as indeed you'll find everybody who's not an, who's not an actual full-time academic is actually working in industry. So therefore, they actually know their onions. They, they're doing it for their day job. Likewise, banking regulation is being delivered by, will be delivered by <coughs> Porrick Fogarty. Porrick, again, works in the, in the central bank and he's intimately involved in this on a day-to-day -day basis. So therefore, again, he's no better person to lead you in banking regulation than one who, 
Facebook Home Today job is regulating banks. And then we go on to talk about corporate finance. Again, we mentioned that you know, obviously if you're working if you're working in industry, and especially if you're working in the treasury function, let's say within industry, you will need to be able to understand how to project, how to plan for an organization's a corporation's future, how we'll be able to meet those financing needs, and again, how to how to actually go off and manage the risk that goes with them. So again, we have Keith Gore from, a, from AIB, <clears throat> again, another first class honors graduate from our program, who is actually leading in this, in this course. And again, is extremely well regarded yeah, is Keith. And again, as I say, at the end of all this, you will be well able, to understand, well able to operate within the actual finance function of a normal corporate, but equally the finance function of a, of a financial institution. Again, second semester, as we, as, as, as we mentioned earlier, starts in late January and continues for, for 12 weeks. And again, the three sub subjects in that case are apply econometrics. Apply, we, why do we discuss econometrics? Well, it is, it is the actual me mechanism by which we assess whether relationships exist within the financial markets. For example, is there, is there a connection between, let's say, interest rates and inflation rates, for example? You could, of course, plot those ones over time and, and make an assessment, yeah, that looks right. But econometrics goes off and tells you to what extent can you actually rely on that relationship continuing to exist into the future. And again, it's absolutely vital. And it will, it will be, become a, a set, give you a toolkit which will stand you in good stead, especially when you're doing your dissertation later on, when you have to go off and try and back up your, your assertions at that your, uh, let's say, that such relationships exist. Again, theory of finance, in a sense, all of everything in finance is based on, <clears throat> on found, you want to have a firm foundations, and therefore theory of finance gives you those foundations. It analyzes over time all the various innovations, all the various, let's say, new insights that have been brought to bear <coughs> sorry, in finance over, over the, more, the more recent past. Finance, again, is a very young, a very young, should we say, um, I suppose science. It's not, and again, it isn't really a science. It's, a, it's, it is a, it is in a sense partly human behavior as well. So we can't just say it's a science. But nevertheless, there are well-known relationships, well-understood relationships at this stage. And theory of finance brings you, to, brings you through those. Then finally, we get to derivatives at the end of first year. So that will be a course I, which I myself deliver, which again, if you like, allows you to understand how to value, let's say, options, um, swaps, forward rate agreements. Again, think of most of, we all, we all come across these every day of the week. They're very often they're used for hedging, although again, they can be used for speculation. And we need to understand what relationship exists between the derivative and the, the, the underlying, as we call it. That could be a stock, it could be a currency, it could be a commodity price, or it could be an interest rate. So again, all of these, um, and, and of course, uh, the exchange rates. So therefore, all of those, we, we, we get to analyze and understand and value derivatives in that course. So year two then, we, we already have, if you like, the first year lays the groundwork, so then we go on more we, to build on those on what we've already learned in first year. So we start off again, as before, late September, we, we go on directly to equity case study. Ruth Lamkin, again, our, one of our own first class, class honors graduates who works works for Mercer, she previously worked for Good Body Stock Brokers, and again, she worked, she worked for Don and Butler Briscoe and so on. She, she worked for, she's had, uh, again, many years of experience in this area. So she will go up and, and lead this module, which will show you how to understand and, uh, what, what value is within an equity, what, what company value exists there. And again, how, what, what value therefore we should be willing to pay for this? Is, there, is a stock overpriced or underpriced? Is it worth investing in it or not? And again, clearly that's a, a very important um, attribute. Then we, we have Shane Murphy from, again, another first class honors graduate of our own program who actually came, who, who works in Irish Life and is, is a portfolio manager within Irish Life. So he again will introduce th the theory behind math portfolio management, the mathematical relations which exist. And again, all it's very practical implementation. It's embedded, where it does very heavy usage made of Excel and, and um, various other tools to actually go off and build out this theory. And then I myself will once more come along and, and deliver the fixed income securities module. Fixed income securities again includes all sorts of bonds and loans. So whether it's whether it's how do you value a mortgage, how do you how do you value a call of a bond, a convertible bond, a, a, again a, a government debt security. And again, no, if if ever the one, if ever that was an important course, it is now becoming ever more important because again we find that there'll be huge amounts of debt being issued by all the all the sovereigns in the world over the coming period to try to pay for the COVID-19 fallout. 
Then the second semester, we'll go on to talk about fund management. So in a sense, fund management, again, is delivered by Shane Murphy. He who delivered the portfolio management theory module in the previous semester. So he will then take that, all the theory that you've, that you've learned there, he then goes off to apply it. And again, in a sense, he's doing what he does for his day job. He's going off and saying, well, look, how, how do insurers um, like Irish Life, for example, for whom he works, how do they go off and manage the funds that they actually have under management? Aviation finance, again, I'm sure you probably all know, Ireland is the epicenter of aviation finance. I think the, 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 the line that, that most often comes to me is, <clears throat> of every two aircraft in the world, one of those is, is leased, and of every two, uh, of every two air, leased aircraft, one of those is leased out of Ireland. So really, you have 20, you have 25% of the global air, aircraft fleet are leased and owned out of Ireland. So it's a huge, a huge important industry. Obviously employs um, very many people in the IFSC and again, very well paying jobs too, I might add. So if you can get into the aviation finance area, despite the current difficulties, um, it, it is, it is um, a, good, a good career move for you. And then finally, we talk about banking. Again, I teach banking myself. <clears throat> My own background is one of which I've actually worked for 20, 20, five, 20, or 20 plus years in banking. And therefore, um, I'm pr pretty familiar with it, I would, su I would suggest. And again, we, we very much look at all aspects of banking, all the risks involved, whether it's interest rate risk or credit, credit risk and so on. And uh, again, we, we look, we, we go through, we build on what, what you would have learned from PORIC in the first semester or first year, in which we talk banking regulation. We then go off to the practical implementations of all the risks associated with the banking, including market risk and so on. So therefore, you, at the end of that period, let's say you are you are pretty well equipped. I would suggest to work in the risk management function in banking, or indeed in the credit function in banking, and so on like that. So really, and if you're already in banking, as I say, you'll certainly widen widen the actual list of jobs for which you are you are um, well qualified. And if you and if you're working outside of banking, you want to get into it, you certainly will find that this will equip you well for doing that. And as we mentioned, the dissertation that goes all the way through, so all through second, first and second semester of second year. You will, you will be guided by Liam in, in generating your, your dissertation proposal, and then obviously in following through with that. So Liam will, will give you the framework, and then you have your own supervisor um, to actually go off and guide you along the way. And that dissertation then generally is, is for delivery at the end of, of, let's say, July. So effectively, you have more or less the months of June and July available to you full time to actually, without any lectures, that is, during which time you can actually go off and prepare your dissertation. And again, I would say just by way of, of detail that you know half one third of the marks go for first year, one third of the marks go for second year, and one third of the marks go for dissertation. So again, that gives you an idea of the emphasis which we put on the dissertation. So in terms of delivery, <coughs> do apologies. Um, obviously, delivery details are extremely important right now because obviously you may ask yourself the question: Is it safe? And the answer is yes, it is very much so. So. If you haven't heard of blended learning, well, you'll hear a lot more about it in the coming years, and it's even I even hear it being mentioned in um, in the media these times. So again, it is it is really the way of the future. Indeed, maybe we should have been there already for many years. We and if you're reading, if you've got old hard copies of our of our let's say of our brochure, you will find mention of the fact that we actually delivered this module midweek in the IFSC in the Spencer Hotel. Well, that was then. This is now. We won't be going going to going to town any longer because realistically, there's no room we could get in town in which we could get the adequate spacing. So instead, we we're actually making a virtue out of necessity. We're now saying, let's go online. Everybody's familiar with Zoom. You're, by definition, you're, we're already on it. So we will continue to deliver the lectures on Wednesday evening. That makes that makes huge benefits. You can imagine on a wet on a wet November evening, trying to cross town, even if you're only over in Harcourt Street and you have to make your way to to the Keys. That could be challenging, not, and then you arrive into lectures all wet. Well, now you don't have to do that. You can sit at your sit at your desk at work, or indeed, if you're getting away a little bit earlier, you can sit at your desk at home and you can log in. And again, the lectures will be recorded as well, so you'll have access to them later. So there's double benefits indeed. I do ask myself at this stage, why did we not do this years ago? But you know, it's funny. We we need we should well let's not waste waste a good crisis as they say. So we're now doing just that. However. And so therefore that's our lectures on midweek will be, will be on Zoom. But, it's, uh, but I do believe that more than anything else, it's the, it's the environment, certainly it's what gives me the buzz. It's the environment that we have, we've created, the environment where you've got lots of 
lots of energetic people keen to learn coming together with different coming from different bringing different experiences to bear meeting together so i have to say i've i've delivered in more recent weeks i've delivered a lot of executive education online speaking to myself um, oh, on a laptop it's pretty challenging i can assure you it's uh, it's not pleasant when when you're not getting classroom feedback and indeed as a learning experience i wouldn't think it's great so therefore we think we've got exactly the right blend between online and in person so on, so on saturday mornings we will be in dcu again the good news is it's uh, well the bad news maybe is it's a an 8 30 start hopefully you'll get used to that and uh, you'll just have to ease off on a friday night but on the saturday morning we'll meet in dcu at 8 30 and we'll go on to 1.30 then. So it's 8.30 till 10.30, well, 10.45, take a short break, and then we come back again to go to 1.30. So again, we, we, have, we have large lecture theatres there, so there's no, no issue about social distancing. We can use the undergraduate theatres. We, we normally had nice rooms upstairs in which, in which people were much closer together and so on like that. Well, again, current circumstances, we we'll now, we'll now again avail of these larger rooms, so we will be able to keep our two metres apart. But more importantly, though, let's we we'll keep the, the the dynamic going. It's absolutely vital. That's what makes that's what the lifeblood of the MSC is. That we have lots of interaction, lots of discussion, and again, I sometimes say with no element of of shall we say humility that in fact you learn as much from your colleagues, uh, from your from your your student colleagues as you will from the lecturer. So again, in particular, this idea of a team spirit. Indeed, I've I've had the pleasure, in fact, of being invited to weddings of former students of mine, where where they met they met on the course and so on like that. And there is, I'm not suggesting it's uh, were necessarily that a, re a good reason for starting for, for coming on the course, but certainly it has been the case in more recent times that we've had. I think we've had, to my knowledge, at this stage, six six different uh, weddings coming from the course over over my period of teaching. So. Again, small class size. This is not undergraduate. This is this is um, a postgraduate, and therefore postgraduate by definition is collaborative. It's discursive. It means it means that we actually get to, get to negotiate the issues. I've had I've had situations. I've taught in uh, well, again one of the virtues of being that much older is that I've taught in all the universities in Dublin actually at this stage, including Maynooth. And again, without naming anyone, I've I've been I've been large postgraduate classes. With, with, lot, with lots of, of um, students who came directly off of undergraduate programs in other universities and very often in other parts of the world. And the classroom dynamic was quite poor. And I must say, it was quite, it was quite this, I was, came, came away quite frustrated because I didn't feel we had the, the opportunity to engage. And indeed, the people who came directly off the undergraduate program didn't actually have the knowledge base, the understanding of the issues to be able to go off and engage with the, with the topic and engage with one another in the way I would have liked. So therefore, we make a virtue out of having small class sizes, and certainly our class sizes are usually in the 20s. But again, as I say, it's more dictated by the quality of the student we get. We simply, we decline students, we think that they're not up to the task. But um, as I say, for the most part, as I say, we, um, I mean, we, we look for students who've had experience, and um, therefore we'll, we'll say, but the, the benefit of the small class size particularly is access to lecturers so you so really if you're start, if you're if you have a question in the class there's a, there are 80 people or 200 people as an undergraduate situation if you if you have a question to ask you wouldn't dare ask it would you you'd be afraid to ask or you'd be embarrassed to ask whereas here there's absolutely not you can talk to the lecturer obviously we encourage you to to, to, to ask questions in class but equally you have access to lectures outside of class. Our numbers are such that you won't overwhelm us with only with, with only the modest class sizes, we, we easily respond, and we do. And we, 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 make a, we certainly are very proud of the fact that we're very responsible in that context. Sorry, that's a, we've got a little bit of out of line there. So collaborative learning. So the learning is very much collaborative. We, 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 we put huge emphasis on group assignments. So we like people to work together because again, not emphasizing the point, it's very much a case of we're learning in, in, in collectively and we're learning from one another. So it's, it's, it's um, again, one of the huge benefits. And again, finally, classroom discussion. I mean, really, it's not a question of what they call this, the sage on the stage. Rather more, it's, it's all, uh, that the lecturer is really there to facilitate the discussion. Obviously, we expect you to read the material before and we expect you to come to your own, to, to have decided more or less, well, or see what the key issues are, and then we discuss them for, amongst ourselves. And it was the, the, one of the benefits, again, especially in the current environment, is our, pretty much everything you want is available online. And we have a wonderful library resource there. I mean, we obviously have a wonderful library too, indeed. In a sense, it's sad that we won't be able to use that to the extent you might otherwise do, and as we've done in the past. But more or less, all the facilities you really want are available online. We have, we have access to most of the best databases, Bloomberg, 
you, you mentioned that we have those that we have those access have access to these resources, so therefore they will be available to you. <coughs> so then, in terms of entry requirements, the first thing is this is not just postgraduate; it's post post experience postgraduate. So we do not want people applying who have just simply come off of the third year or fourth year in college and they're and they what they think they're going to continue more than doing that we have we have full-time postgraduate program the, the msc of our own msc in finance is a very good program and i would certainly recommend that to anybody who is who is maybe in their final year and i know one or two people on the call at least would lined up or on the were available or sorry we're coming from that kind of background uh, come to us when you have a bit of experience i mean it could be it could be that you're working for three or four months already and if you think you really you really are equipped for that by all, by all means, come along. But really, everybody who, who comes to this program is working currently. And again, the nature. So you've, you've you've two streams that come into us. One is they're working in financial services. In that case, um, a, year, a year or two year experience, two years experience in financial services really ample to get you to the point where you you are able for the course. And then others maybe who've got a business maths accounting background, maybe they're working elsewhere and they're saying, you know what, I'd like to get in. In fact, just this morning, I, I, I approved an application from, a, from an individual with, who, who had a legal background and again, who realized that, that, he, that he was actually working in an environment in which knowledge of financial services was actually key. And therefore, he, did, he felt ill-equipped to deal with some of the issues that were coming, that were coming his way. And therefore, he said, look, I need to get a financial, I need to get the, the, the kind of the knowledge that, that this course will provide to enable him to do his day job better. So therefore, um, as I say, people from, people from that kind of background, again, if, as, as long as he's had, he's had um, ex experience, the, the relevant experience, let's say, because he's coming across this in his day job, he will be able to, he will be able to transition as well. But so experience really counts. I mean, we do, we've, I've, we've had some of our very best students indeed have been those who've been 20 years out of college, went, went directly from, from, from leaving, leaving CERT into, the, into work, and they've worked their way up through the organization. They've done, they've done everything. They don't have the formal qualifications. Some of those have been our very best students. They've, they've, and furthermore, they've really enjoyed it most, and I, and I keep in contact with many of them, quite honestly. Um, so really, anybody who has not got, doesn't have the formal undergraduate qualification, or doesn't have the accounting or other qualification, that doesn't exclude you. If you're working in the area, that would not be a problem. And again, so sometimes I'd ask the question, well, what prior knowledge are we assuming? Well, the answer is roughly, well, more or less none. We actually take everything from, we obviously we go through it rather quickly, but we do take it from the from ground zero. Really. We say, look, uh, we'll, we'll assume, we're assuming we know knowledge, have no prior knowledge, because again, if you come from a maths background, you obviously have the skill sets available to it, but you wouldn't necessarily have the business, the business um, experience to be able to support you. So therefore, um, as I say, we, we always assume no prior knowledge. And again, like I say, to emphasize, no, no undergraduate requirements if you actually have long experience. So, you know, five or six years of experience, it counts far more in my mind than an undergraduate degree because you've got the stripes on your back. You know how, you know what works. You, you've, you've experienced it on a day basis. And again, um, the age range typically as low as young as 23. So for one of the, those, those young undergraduates who's actually working for a year, maybe who wants to go off and do it or indeed is working only for four or five months should they have graduated in let's say in um, April or May. Uh, but we've had we've had people in 50 years and indeed over in one certain situation and again they all get on extremely well as I say our, our median age is 27 so we are generally talking about people who come toward the end of their, towards the end of their 20s who are looking to progress maybe again a kind of a classic case would be somebody who's working let's say in a fund accounting area for example and they're saying you know what um, my 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 prospects here are limited. I mean, I'm seeing all these all, all these all these assets coming through these financial assets, ETFs, whatever they happen to be. And I, but really, I'd like to know more. How first of all, how are they? I, I'm seeing a price in the screen, but I'd like to know what's how is that price in the screen determined? And again, what about the individual who made the decision to actually go off and uh, purchase that asset? What well, uh, I'd like to become that person, possibly. Again, that would be a classic a classic example. So again, back to the, back, where will you find our graduates? And indeed, I suppose you might also ask, where will you find the people who are coming onto the program so that we like yourselves? Well, the answer is <clears throat> in all the different banks. So the five, the five local banks, you talk about the Bank, bank of America, Barclays, you know, all of, all of the other BNP, um, you'll find all of the, all of the, the, the European, the US banks um, down, based down on the IFSC, plus the actual five main Irish banks, and of course, from the central bank as well. 
So again, that would be one of the one of the major streams of just where our people are working and where they actually come from. Again, on the on the investment side, you know, with pension funds, insurers, and investment houses. So those people come for us, particularly obviously for the investment side of that thing, but they also want they want the wider understanding of the financial market. So that's why why they come and that's where they find jobs afterwards as well. Again, non-bank financial institutions. We've had we've we've had students from <coughs> from from the likes of uh, let's say Dillisk, ICS, again Finance Ireland, all of these other ones that aren't that aren't banks, but they actually are engaged in bank-like activities. They just aren't regulated as banks. So you'll find many students come from there. And again, aircraft lessers. We have multiple students. I would say maybe upwards of twenty students working in the aircraft leasing area. We've only introduced the air aircraft leasing as a specific module more recently, and it was really in recognition of the fact that, look, this was becoming a very big area. It was a major area of employment, and again, in particular, a major area of very good, high quality employment. Again, corporate treasury. So you could work, obviously, in the finance function within the corporate, and in particular in the treasury function, because all of the skills that you need will be covering those. Again, those very same treasury functions, uh, treasury, um, let's say qualifications or qual treasury knowledge that you need is also equally applicable, of course, in a banking environment. And then we talk as well about fund managers. So you, you, we, we're thinking of, you know, whether it's, whether it's a Bernie and a New Ireland or Irish Life or whatever, all of, the, all of those fund managers, uh, we, many, many, many of, our employer, of our graduates you know, find, find work in those places. And then finally, uh, we have the other major cohort then will be obviously the big four accounting firms. So obviously KPMG, PwC, Deloitte, and, and EY. And Mercer, again, is a, a, again very much, they, their, their people come to us and, and go to them afterwards because of the fund, because of their understanding of funding and, and, and pensions and so on. Likewise, the likes of Accenture and all and the legal firms, they, they will again come because they want the specific knowledge of, of, of um, of finance that we actually we afford and so again we've had we've got students again in, in first and second year from, from all of those firms 